Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily Ostara, Chloe, Bella. As always, I want to remind you to stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And we are going to get back into Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. And without further ado, let's get there. Okay, today we are back on Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. We are we got to the part where Gage's funeral they had Gage's funeral and he was buried and looks like we're gonna get into Judd's story about Timmy Baderman and we're in chapter thirty nine. In those days, back during the war, I mean, the train still stopped in Orrington and Bill Baderman had a funeral Hack there at the Loden Depot to meet the freight carrying the body of his son Timmy. The coffin was loaded by four railroad men. I was one of them. There was an army fellow on board from Graves and Registration. That was the army's wartime version of Undertaker's Lewis. But he never got off the train. He was sitting drunk in a boxcar that still had 12 coffins in it. We put Timmy into the back of a mortuary Cadillac. In those days, it still wasn't uncommon to hear such things called hurry up wagons because in the old days the major concern was to get them into the ground before they rotted. Bill Baderman stood by by his face stony and kinda I dunno kinda dry, I guess you'd say. He wept no tears. Huey Garber was driving the train that day and he said that army fella had really had a tour for himself. Huey said they'd flown in a whole shitload of those coffins to limestone and press guile at which point both the coffins and their keeper and train for point south. The army fella comes walking up to Huey and he takes a fifth of rye whiskey out of his uniform blouse and he says in this soft, drawly Dixie voice, Well, Mr. Engineer, you're driving a mystery train today. Did you know that? Huey shakes his head. Well, you are. At least that's what they call a funeral train down in Alabama. Huey says the fella took a list out of his pocket and squinted at it. We are going to start by dropping two of those coffins off in Holton and then I've got one for... Pass a dumb keg, two for Bangor, one for Derry, and one for Ludlow, and so on. I feel like a fugging milkman. You want a drink? Well, Huey declines the drink on the ground, so that the Bangor and Roostick is pretty funny, fussy on the subject of train drivers with rye in their breaths. And the fellow from Graves and Registration don't hold it against Huey any more than Huey holds the fact of the Army's fellow's drunkenness against him. They even shook on her, Huey said. <clears throat> so off they go, dropping those flag-covered coffins every other stop or two, 18 or 20 of them in all. Huey, and it went on all the way to Boston, and there was weeping and wailing relatives at every stop except Ludlow, and at Ludlow he was treated to the sight of Bill Baderman, who was, who he said looked like a, looked like he was dead inside and just waiting for his soul to stink. When he got off that train, he said he woke up that army fella, and they hit some spots, 15 or 20, and Huey got drunker than he had ever been, and went to a whore, which he'd never done in his whole life, and woke up with a set of crabs so big and mean they gave him the shivers, and he said that if that was what they called the mystery train, he never wanted to drive no mystery train again. Timmy's body was taken up to the Greenspan funeral home on Fern Street. It used to be across from where the new Franklin Laundry stands. Now, and two days later, he was buried in Pleasant View Cemetery with full military honors. Well, I tell you, Lewis, Mrs. Baderman was dead ten years then, along with the second child she tried to bring into the world. And that had a lot to do with what happened. A second child might have helped to ease the pain, don't you think? A second child might have reminded old Bill that there's others that feel the pain and have to be helped th through. I guess in that way, you're luckier having another child and all. I mean, a child and a wife who are both alive and well. According to the letter Bill got from the lieutenant in charge of his boy's platoon, Timmy was shot down the road to Rome on July 5th, 15th, 1943. His body was shipped home two days later and it got to Limestone on the 19th. It was put aboard Huey Garber's mystery train the very next day. Most of the GIs who got killed in Europe were buried in Europe. But all of the boys who went home on that train were special. 
Timmy had di died charging a machine gun nest, and he had won the Silver Star posthumously. Timmy was buried, don't hold me to this, but I think it was on July 22nd. It was four or five days later that Marjorie Washburn, who was the mailwoman in those days, saw Timmy walking up the road toward York's li livery stable. Well, Marjorie damn near drove right out the road, and you can understand why. She went back to the post office, tossed her leather bag with all her undelivered mail still in it on George Anderson's desk, and told him she was going home and to bed right then. What's that little bit? Margie, are you sick? George asks. You are just as white as a gull's wing. I've had the fright of my life, and I don't want to talk to you about it, Margie Washburn says. I ain't going to talk to going to talk to Brian about it, or my mom, or anybody. When I get up to heaven, if Jesus asks me to talk to him about it, maybe I will. But I don't believe it. And out she goes. I guess I don't blame her seeing a walking zombie. Everybody knew Timmy was dead. There was his obituary in the Bangor Daily News and the Ellsworth American just the week before. Picture and all, and half the town turned out for his funeral up to the city, and here Margie seen him walking up the road, lurching up the road. She finally told old George Anderson, only this was 20 years later, and she was dying, and George told me it seemed to him like she wanted to tell somebody what she'd seen. George said it seemed to him like it preyed on her mind, you know. Pale he was, he said, and dressed in an old pair of chino pants and a faded flannel hunting shirt, although it must have been 90 degrees in the shade that day. Margie said all his hair was sticking up in the back. His eyes were like raisins stuck in bread dough. I saw a ghost that day, George. That's what scared me so. I never thought I'd seen see such a thing, but there it was. Well, word got around. Pretty soon, some other people saw Timmy, too. Mrs. Stratton? Well, we called her Mrs., but so far as anyone knew, she could have been single or divorced or grass widowed. She had little, a little two-room house down where the Pedersen Road joins the Hancock Road. And she had a lot of jazz records, and sometimes she'd be willing to throw you a little party if you had a ten-dollar bill that wasn't working too hard. Well, she saw him from her porch, and she said he walked right up to the edge of the road and stopped there. He just stood there, she said, his hands dangling at his sides and his head pushed forward, looking like a boxer who's ready to eat him some canvas. She said she stood there on her porch, heart going like sixty, too scared to move. Then she said he turned around, and it was like watching a drunk man try to do an about face. One leg went one way, and the other foot turned, and he just about fell over. She said he looked right at her, and all the strength just run out of her hands, and she dropped the basket of washing she had. The clothes fell out and got smutty all over again. She said, his eyes, she said they looked as dead and dusty as marbles, Louis, but he saw her, and he grinned, and she said he talked to her. Asked her if she still had those records because he wouldn't mind cutting a rug with her. Maybe that very night, and Mrs. Stratton went back inside, and she wouldn't come out for most of a week, and by then it was over anyway. A lot of people saw Timmy Baderman. Many of them are dead now. Mrs. Stratton is, for one, and others have moved on. But there are a few old crocs like me le left around who will tell you if you ask them right. We saw him, I tell you, walking back and forth along the Pedersen Road, a mile east of his daddy's house. And a mile west, back and forth he went, back and forth all day, for all anyone knew all night. Shirt untucked, pale face, hair all stuck up in spikes, fly unzipped sometimes. And this look on his face, this look, Judd paused to light a cigarette, then shook the match out and looked at Lewis through the haze of drifting blue smoke. And all the story was, and although the story was, of course, utterly mad, there was no lie in Judd's eyes. You know, they have these stories in these movies, I don't know if they are true about zombies down in Haiti. In the movies, they just sort of shamble along with their dead eyes, staring straight ahead, real slow and sort of clumsy. All the zombies are. The people have been drugged and they dig them up. Nobody comes back to life like that. Timmy Bateman was like that, Lewis, like a zombie in a movie, but he wasn't. There was something more. There was something going on behind his eyes, and sometimes you could see it. Sometimes you couldn't see it. Some then behind his eyes, Lewis, I don't think that thinking is what I want to call it. I don't know what in the hell I want to call it. It was sly, that was one thing. Like him telling Mrs. Stratton he wanted to cut a rug with her. There was something going on in there, Lewis, but I don't think it was thinking, and I don't think it had much, maybe nothing at all, to do with Timmy Baderman. It was more like a radio signal 
that was coming from somewhere else. You looked at him and you thought, if he touches me, I'm going to scream like that. More like an evil spirit that invaded his body, I guess. Back and forth he went, up and down the road, and one day after I got home from work, this must have been, oh, I'm going to say it was July 30th or so, here is George Anderson, the postmaster, don't you know, sitting on the back porch drinking iced tea with Hannibal Benson, who was then on our second selectman, Alan Purrington, who was fire chief. Norma sat there, too, but never said a thing. George kept rubbing the stump at the top of his right leg. Lost most of that leg working on the railroad, he did, and the stump used to bother him something fierce in those hot and muggy days, but here he was, m misery or not. This had gone far enough, George says to me. I've got, I got a male woman who won't deliver out on the Patterson Road. That's one thing. It's starting to raise cane with the government, and that's something else. What do you mean it's raising cane with the government, I asked. Hannibal said he'd had a call from the War Department, some lieutenant named Kinsman, whose job it was to sort out malicious mischief from plain old Tom Foolery. Four or five people have written anonymous letters to the War Department, Hannibal says. And this Lieutenant Kinsman is starting to get a little bit concerned. It was just one fellow who had written one letter, they'd laugh it off. It was just one fellow writing a whole bunch of letters, Kinsman said. He called the state police up in Derry Barracks and told them they might have a psychopath with a hate on against the Baderman family in Ludlow. Well, these letters all came from different people. He said you could tell that by the handwriting, name or no name. And they all say the same crazy thing, that Timmy Baderman is dead, he makes one hell of a lively corpse walking up and down Patterson Road with his bare face hanging out. This kinsman is going to send a fellow out or come himself, but this don't settle down, animal finishes up. They want to know if Timmy's dead or AWOL. Well, the other ones are shipped from home, I wouldn't call that AWOL. Or what, because they don't like to think their records are all, are all at sixes and sevens. Also, they are going to want to know who was buried in Timmy Baderman's box if he wasn't. Well, you can see what kind of a mess it was, Lewis. We sat there most of an hour drinking iced tea and talking it over. Norma asked us if we wanted sandwiches, but no one did. We talked it around and talked it around, and finally we decided we had to go out there to the Baderman place. I'll never forget that night, not if I lived to be twice as old as I, old as I am. It was hot, hotter than the hinges of hell, with the sun going down like a bucket of guts behind the clouds. There was one, there was none of us wanted to go, but we had to. Norma knew it for any of us. She got me aside, inside on some pretext or other, and said, don't you let them dither around and put this off, Judson. You got to get this taken care of. It's an abomination. Judd measured Lewis evenly with his eyes. That was what she called it, Lewis. It was her word, abomination. She kind of whispers in my ear. If anything happens, Judd, you just run. Never mind these others. They'll have to look out for themselves. You remember me and bust your hump right out there if anything happens. We drove over in Hannibal Benson's car. That son of a bitch got all the aid coupons he wanted. I don't know how. Nobody said much. But all four of us were smoking like chimbleys. We were scared, Louis, just as scared as we could be. But the only one who really said anything was Alan Purinton. He says to George, Bill Baderman has been up to Dickens in that woods north of Route 15. And I'll put my warrant to that and nobody answered but I remember George nodding his head. Well we got there and Alan knocked but nobody answered so we went around to the back and there the two of them were. Bill Baderman was sitting there on his back stoop with a pitcher of beer and Timmy was at the back of the yard just staring up at that red bloody sun as it went down. His whole face was orange with it like he'd been flayed alive and Bill he looked like the devil had gotten him after his seven years of highfalutin. He was floating in his clothes, and I judged he'd lost 40 pounds. His eyes had gone back in their sockets until they were like little animals in a pair of caves, and his mouth kept going tick-tock, tick, on the left side. Judd paused, seemed to consider, and then nodded imperceptibly. Lewis, he looked damned. Timmy looked around and at us and grinned. Just seeing him grin made you want to scream. Then he turned and went black, back to looking at the sun go down. Bill says, I didn't hear you boys knock, which was a bald-faced lie, of course, since Alan laid on that door loud enough to wake the to wake of a deaf man. No one seemed like they was going to say anything, so I says, Bill, I heard your boy was killed over in Italy. That was a mistake, he says, looking right at me. Was it, I says? You see him standing right there, don't you, he says. So who do you reckon was in that coffin you had buried out at Pleasant View, Alan Purinton asks him. Be damned if I know, Bill says. Be damned if I care. 
He goes to get a cigarette and spills them all over the back porch, then breaks two or three, trying to pick them up. Probably have to be an exclamation. Hannibal says, you know that, don't you? I had a call from the goddamn War Department, Bill. They're going to want to know if they buried some other mother's son under Timmy's name. Well, what in the hell of it, Bill says in a loud voice. That's nothing to me, is it? I got my boy, Timmy, came come home the other day. He's been shell-shocked or something. He's a little strange now, but he'll come around. Let's quit this, Bill, I says. And all at once I was pretty mad at him. If and when they dig up th that army coffin, they're going to find it dead empty unless you went to the trouble of filling it out with rocks after you took your boy out of it. And I don't think you did. I know what happened. Hannibal and George and Alan here know what happened. You know what happened, too. You see, you've been fooling around up in the woods, Bill, and you've caused yourself in this town a lot of trouble. You fellas know your way out, I guess, he says. I don't have to explain myself to you or justify myself to you. Nothing. When I got that telegram, the life ran up right out of me. I felt her go just like piss down the inside of my leg. Well, I got my boy back. They had no right to take my boy. He was only 17. He was all I had left of his dear mother, and it was ill-fucking-legal. So fuck the Army, and fuck the War Department, and fuck the United States of America. Fuck you boys, too. I got him back. He'll come around, and that's all I gotta say. Now you all just march your boots back where you came from. He just had a point. He, yeah, not supposed to take what you know, the Army is not supposed to do. It's two different things. And his mouth is tick tock Tick, tick, talking, you know, tick, tick, ticking, and there's sweat all over his forehead and big drops, and that was when I saw him, and that was when I saw him. He was crazy. It would have driven me crazy, too, living with that, that thing. Lewis was feeling sick to his stomach. He had drunk too much beer too fast. Pretty soon it was all going to come up on him. The heavy load of feeling in his stomach told him it would be coming up soon. Well, there wasn't much else we could do. We got ready to go. Hannibal says, God... Bill, God help you. Bill says, God never helped me. I helped myself. That was when Timmy walked over to us. He even walked wrong, Lewis. He walked like an old, old man. He put one foot high up and then bring it down and kind of shuffle and then looked the other one. It's like watching a crab walk. His hands dangled down by his legs and when he got close enough, you could see red marks across his face on the slant like pimples or little burns. I reckon that's where the kraut machine got him. Got him. Must have damn near blowed his head off. And he stank of the grave. It was a black smell, like everything inside him was just lying there, spoiled. I saw Alan peering at him, put a hand up to cover his mouth, nose and mouth. The stench was just awful. You almost expected to see grave maggots squirming around in his hair. Stop, Lewis said hoarsely. I've heard enough. You ain't, Judge said. He spoke with haggard earnest. I said, that is, you ain't. And I can't even make it as bad as it was. Nobody could understand how bad it was, unless they were there. He was dead, Lewis, but he was alive, too, and he, he, he knew things. Knew things, Lewis sat forward. Hey, uh, he looked at Alan for a long time, kind of grinning. You could see his teeth anyway, and then he spoke in this low voice. You felt like you had to strain forward to hear it. It sounded like he had gravel down his tube. Your wife is fucking that man she worked with down at the drugstore, Purinton. Purinton. What do you think of that? She screams when she comes. What do you think of that? Alan, he kind of gasped, and you can... See, it had hit him. Alan's in a nursing home up in Gardner now, or was the last I heard. He might must be pushing 90. Back when all this happened, he was 40 or so, and there had been some talk around about his second wife. She was his second cousin, and she had come to live with Alan, Alan's first wife, Lucy, just before the war. Well, Lucy died, and a year and a half later, Alan up and married this girl, Laureen, her name was. She was no more than 24 when they married, there had been some talk about her, you know. If you were a man, you might have called her way, her ways sort of free and easy and let it go at that. But the women thought she might be loose. And maybe Alan had had a few thoughts in that direction, too, because he says, Shut up, shut up, I'll knock you down, whatever you are. Shush now, Timmy, Bill says, and he looks worse than ever. You know, like, maybe he's going to puke or faint dead away or do both. You shush, Timmy. But Timmy didn't make no take no notice. He looked around at George Anderson, he says, that grandson you set such a store by is just waiting for you to die, old man. The money is all he wants. The m money he thinks you got socked away in your lockbox at the Bangor Eastern Bank. That's why he makes up to you. But behind your back, he makes fun of you. Him and his sister, old wooden leg, that's what they call you. 
Timmy says, and Lewis, his voice, is, it changed. It got mean. It sounded like the way that grandson of George's would have sounded if, you know, if the things Timmy was saying was true. Old wooden leg, Timmy says. And won't they ship when they find out you are as, you're as poor as a church mouse because you lost it all in 1938? Won't they shit, George? Won't they just shit? George, he backed away then, and his wooden leg buckled under him. And he fell back on Bill's porch and upset upset his pitcher of beer, and he was as white as your undershirt, Lewis. Bill, he gets him back on his feet somehow, and he's roaring at his boy, Timmy, you stop it, you stop it, but Timmy wouldn't. He said something bad about Hannibal, and then he had something... And he said something bad about me, too. And by then, he was raving, I'd say. Yeah, he was raving, all right, screaming. And we started to back away, and then we started to run, dragging George along the best we could by the arm because he's, he'd gotten the straps and harnesses on the fake leg twisted somehow. It was all off to one side with the shoe turned around back when dragging on the grass. Last I seen him, Timmy Bateman, he was on the back lawn by the clothesline, his face all red in the setting sun. Those marks standing out in his face, his hair all crazy and dusty somehow, when he was laughing and screeching over and over again. Old wooden leg, old wooden leg, and the cuckold, and the whoremaster. Goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye, goodbye. And then he laughed, but it was screaming, really. Something inside him screaming and screaming and screaming. Judd stopped. His chest moved up and down rapidly. Judd Lewis said, The thing this Timmy Baderman told you, was it true? It was true, Judd muttered. Christ, it was true. I used to go to a whorehouse in Bangor betimes. Nothing many a man hasn't done, although suppose there are plenty that walk the straight and narrow. I just would get that get the urge, a compulsion maybe, to sink it into strange flush now and then. Or pay some woman to do the things a man can't bring himself to ask his wife to do. Men keep their gardens too, Lewis. It wasn't a terrible thing what I done, and all that has been behind me for the last eight or nine years. That's it, at eighty? Wow. You had a long life. Norma would not have left me if she had known, but something in her would have died forever, something dear and sweet. Judd's eyes were red and swollen and bleary. The tears of the old are singularly unlovely, Lewis thought. But when Judd groped across the table for Lewis's hand, Lewis took it firmly. He told us only the bad, he said after a moment. Only the bad. God knows there is enough of that in my any human being's life isn't there two or three days later Laureen Purinton left Ludlow for good and folks in town who saw her before she got on the train said she was sprouting two shiners and cotton stuffed up both boards of her pump Alan he would never talk about it George died in 1950 and if he left anything to that grandson and granddaughter of his I never heard about it Hannibal got kicked out of office because of something that was just like what Timmy Bateman accused him of I won't tell you exactly what it was. You don't need to know. But misappropriation of town funds for his own use comes close to enough to cover it, I reckon. There was even talk of trying him on embezzlement charges, but it never came to much. Losing the post was enough punishment for him anyway. His whole life was playing the big cheese. But there was good in those men, too. That's what I mean. That's what folks always find it so hard to remember. It was Hannibal got the funds started for the Eastern General Hospital right before the war. Alan Puritan was one of the most generous, open-handed men I ever knew, and old George Anderson only wanted to go on running the post office forever. It was only the bad it wanted to talk about, though. It was only the bad it wanted us to remember, because it was bad, and because it knew we meant danger for it. For it. The Timmy Baderman that went off to fight the war was a nice, ordinary kid, Lewis, maybe a little dull, but good-hearted. The thing we saw that night looking up into that red sun, that was a monster. Maybe it was a zombie or or debuck or demon maybe there's no name for such a thing as that but the micmacs would have known what it was name or no what lewis said numbly something that has been that had been touched by the wendigo judge said evenly he took a deep breath held it for a moment let it out and looked at his watch i think demon boat summed it up whatever you want something bad well a day the hours laid Lewis, I've talked nine times as much as I meant to. I doubt that, Lewis said. You've been very eloquent. Tell me how it came out. There was a fire at the Baderman place two nights later, Judd said. The house burned flat. Alan Puritan and there was no said there was no doubt about the fire being set. Rain oil had been splashed from 
one end of that little house to the other. You could smell the reek of it for three days after the fire was out. So they both burned up. Oh, yeah, they burned, but they was dead beforehand. Timmy was shot twice in the chest with a pistol. Bill Baderman kept handy in old Colts. They found it in Bill's hand. What he'd done or so it looked like was to kill his boy, lay him on the bed, and then spill out the, that range oil. Then he sat down in his easy chair by the radio, flicked a match, and ate the barrel of that Colt forty-five. Jesus, Lewis said. They were pretty well charred, but the county medical examiner said it looked to him like Timmy Baderman had been dead two or three weeks. Silence ticking out. Judd got up. I wasn't exaggerating when I said I might have killed your boy, Lewis, or had a hand in it. The Micmacs knew that place, but that doesn't necessarily mean they made it what it was. The Micmacs weren't always here. They came maybe from Canada, maybe from Russia, maybe from Asia, way back in the beginning, closer to the truth, when the land um, strayed apart. They stayed here in Maine for a thousand years, or maybe it was two thousand, it's hard to tell, because they did not leave their mark on the land. And now they are gone again, same way we'll be gone someday, although I guess I'll mark go deeper for better or worse. But the place will stay no matter what. No matter who's here, Lewis, it isn't as though someone owned it and could take it secret when they moved on. It's an evil, curdled place. And I had no business taking you up there to bury that cat. I know that now. It has a power. You'll be aware of if you know what's good for your family and what's good for you. I wasn't good enough, strong enough to fight it. You saved Norma's life, and I wanted to do something for you. And that place turned my good wish to its own evil purpose. It has a power, and I think that power goes... Through phases, same as the moon. It's been full of power before. And I'm scared it's coming around to full again. I'm scared it used to use me to get at you through your son. Do you, do you see, Lewis, what I'm getting at? His head pleaded with Lewis. You're saying the place knew Gage was going to die, I think, Lewis said. No, I'm saying the place might have made Gage die because I introduced you to the power in the place. I'm saying I may have murdered your son with a good intentions, Lewis. I don't believe it, Lewis said. At last, shakily. Didn't, would, didn't, wouldn't, couldn't. He held Judge's hand, Judd's hand tightly. We are burying Gage tomorrow in Bangor. And in Bangor he will stay. I don't plan to go up there to the pet cemetery beyond it ever again. Promise me, Judge said harshly. Promise. I promise, Lewis said. In the back of his mind, contemplation remained. A dance and flicker of promise that could not, that would not quite go away. It's the end of chapter 39. Ugh. See there? And we're gonna work. We're gonna go to chapter forty. Get along. It's not too long. Chapter forty. But none of those things happened. All of them. The droning Orinco truck. The fingers that just touched the back of Gage's jumper and then slid off. Rachel preparing to go to the view in her house coat. Ellie carrying Gage's picture and putting his chair next to her bed. Steve Masterton's tears. The fight with Irwin Goldman. Judd Crandall's terrible story of Timmy Baderman. All of them existed only in Lewis Creed's mind during the few seconds that passed while he raced his laughing son to the road. Behind him, Rachel screamed again, Gage, come back, don't run. But Lewis did not waste his breath. It was going to be close, very close, and yes, one of those things really happened. From somewhere up the road, he could hear the drone of the oncoming truck. And somewhere inside, a memory circuit opened, and he could hear Judd Crandall speaking to Rachel on that very first day. Wait, hold on a second, I did that wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, on that very first day. In Ludlow. You want to watch him around that the road, Mrs. Creed. It's a bad road for kids and pets. Now, Gage was running down the gentle slope of lawn that merged with the soft shoulder Route 15. His husky little legs pumping, and by all the rights of the world, he should have fallen over sprawling, but he just kept going, and now the sound of the truck was very loud indeed. It was that loud, snoring sound that Lewis sometimes heard from his bed as he floated just beyond the rim of sleep. Then it seemed a comforting sound, but now it terrified him. Oh, my dear God, oh, my dear Jesus, let me catch him. Don't let him get into the road. Lewis put on a final burst of speed and leapt, throwing himself out straight and parallel to the ground like a football player about to make a tackle. He could see his shadow tracking long on the grass below him in the lowest periphery of his vision, and he thought of the kite, the vulture, printing its shadow all the way across Mint Mrs. Vinton's field, and just as Gage's forward motion carried him into the road, Lewis's finger brushed the back of his jacket and then snagged it. 
He yanked Gage backward and landed on the ground at the same instant, crashing his face into the rough gravel of the shoulder, giving himself a bloody nose. His balls signaled a much more serious flash of pain. Oh, if I'd uh, known I was going to be playing football, I would have worn my jock, but both the pain in his nose, driving agony's testes, was lot. <laughs> Excuse me, were lost in the swelling relief of hearing Gage's wail of pain and outrage at his bottom as his bottom landed on the shoulder and he fell over backward into the edge of the lawn, thumping his head. A moment later, his wails were drowned by the roar of the passing truck and the almost regal blat of its air horn. Lewis managed to get up in spite of the, 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 the lead ball, the lead ball sitting in his lower stomach and cradled his son in his arms. A moment later, Rachel joined them, also weeping, crying out Gage. Never run in the road, Gage. Never, never, never. The road is bad, bad. And Gage was so astonished at his tearful lecture that he left off crying and goggled up at his mother. Lewis, your nose is bleeding, she said, and then hugged him so suddenly and strongly that for a moment he could barely breathe. That isn't the worst of it, he said. I think I'm sterile, Rachel. Oh, boy, the pain. And she laughed so hysterically that for a few moments he was frightened for her. A thought crossed his mind. If Gage really had been killed, I believe it would have driven her crazy. But Gage was not killed. All of that had been so, but all of that had only been a hellishly detailed moment of imagination as Lewis out raced his son's death across a green lawn on a sunshiny May afternoon. Gage went to grammar school and at the age of seven he began going to camp where he showed a wonderful and surprising aptitude for swimming. He also gave his parents a rather glum surprise by proving himself able to handle a month's separation with no noticeable psychic trauma. By the time he was ten, he was spending the entire summer away at Camp Agawam in Raymond. In eleven, he won two blue ribbons and a red one at the four camps swimathon that ended the summer's activities. He grew tall, and yet, through it, through it all, he was the same Gage, sweet and rather surprised at the things the world held out. And for Gage, the fruit was somehow never bitter or rotten. It's too hot. He was an honor student in high school, a member of the swimming team at John Bapp's, the parochial school he had insisted on attending because of its swimming facilities. Rachel was upset, but Lewis was not particularly surprised. And at 17, Gage announced his intention to convert to Catholicism. Rachel believed that all of it was because of the girl Gage was going out with. She saw marriage in his immediate future. If that little slut with the St. Christopher's medal isn't bawling him, I'll eat your shorts, Lewis, she said. The wreckage of his college plans and his Olympic hopes and nine or ten little Catholics running around by the time Gage was 40. But then he would be, according to Rachel anyway, a cigar-smoking truck driver with a beer belly, our fathering and hail marrying his way into pre-cardiac oblivion. Lewis suspected his son's motives were rather more pure, and although Gage converted in on the day he actually did the deed, Lewis sent in unabashedly Nasty postcard to Irwin Goldman. It read, Perhaps you'll have a Jesuit grandson yet. Your gory son in law, Lewis. He did not marry the rather nice, decidedly unslutty girl he had dated through most of his senior year. He went on to John Hopkins, made the Olympic swimming team, and on one long, dazzling, incredibly proud afternoon, 16 years after Lewis had raised an, raced an Orinco truck for his son's life. And Rachel, who had now gone almost entirely gray, although she covered it with a rinse, watched their son with, win a gold medal for the USA. When the NBC cameras moved in for a close-up of him, standing with his dripping seal sleek head back, his eyes open and calm and fixed on the flag as the national anthem played, the ribbon around his neck and the gold lying against the smooth skin of his chest, Lewis wept. He and Rachel both wept. I guess this caps everything, he said huskily, and turned to embrace his wife. But she was looking at him with dawning horror. Her face seemed to age before his eyes, his, as if whipped by days and months and years of evil time. The sound of the national anthem faded, and when Lewis looked back at the TV, he saw a different boy there, a black boy with a head of tight curls in which germs of water, or excuse me, gems of water still gleamed. This caps everything. His cap, his cap is, oh dear God, his cap is full of blood. Lewis woke up in the cold, dead light of a rainy seven o'clock, clutching his pillow in his arms. His head thumped monstrously with his heartbeat. The ache swelled and faded, swelled and faded. He burped, 
acid that tasted like old beer in his stomach heaved miserably. He had been weeping. The pillow was wet with his tears as if he had somehow stumbled in and then out of one of those hokey country and western laments in his sleep. Even in the dream, he thought some part of him had known the truth and had cried for it. He got up and stumbled to the bathroom, heart racing threadily in his chest, consciousness itself fragmented by the fierceness of his hangover. He reached the toilet bowl barely in time and threw up a glut of last night's beer. He kneeled on the floor, eyes closed, until he felt capable of actually making it to his feet. He groped for the handle and flushed the john. He went to the mirror and see how badly bloodshot his eyes were, but the glass had been covered with a square of sheeting. Then he recalled, drawing almost randomly on a past she professed to barely remember, Rachel had covered all the mirrors in the house, and she took off her shoes before entering through the door. No Olympic swimming team, Lewis thought dully as he walked back to his bed and sat down on it. The sour taste of beer coated his mouth and throat, and he swore to himself not for the first time or the last that he would never touch that poison again. No Olympic swimming team, no 3.0 in college, no little Catholic girlfriend of conversion, no Camp Agawam, no, no nothing. His sneakers had been torn off, his jumper turned inside out, his sweet little boy's body so tough and sturdy, nearly dismembered. His cap had been full of blood. Now sitting on his bed in the grip of this numbing hangover, rainwater spilling its lazy courses down the window beside him, his grief came for him fully, like some gray matron from Ward 9 in Purgatory. It came and dissolved him, unmanned him, took away whatever defenses remained, and he put his face in his hands and cried, rocking back and forth on his bed, thinking he would do anything to have a second chance, anything at all. That is the end of chapter 40. And in the next video, we will start back at chapter 41. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And stay tuned for the next video. You have a great night.